This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming a former child actor from the 1950s and 60s. I'll be talking to Johnny Eyman. Johnny Eyman played Monk on the short-lived cult classic sitcom series. McKeever and the Colonel, which was a military school comedy that lasted 62 to 63. We'll be talking about that. He guest starred on so many great shows, though. He was on The Twilight Zone, The Rebel with Nick Adams, Leave it to Beaver, Have Gun, Will Travel, Wagon Train, so many different shows. Leave it to Beaver, and it's going to be a great conversation today. He was even in a band with Ed Begley Jr., like in his late teen years, and he still plays music. He has a great YouTube channel where you can hear his music. He's a pretty good musician, and it's going to be a great conversation today. I'm really looking forward to it. Autumn, September is getting better every time. So yeah, here is my interview with Johnny Eyman. Hey, Johnny, welcome to the show. How are you today? Oh, very good. Glad to talk to you. Thank you so much. This is such a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Oh, certainly. So, going back in time, you, of course, were a child actor. What age did you start gravitating towards acting? Uh, I was six years old, and, uh, you know, about a year and a half before that, we had moved from the south side of Chicago (laughs) to (laughs) L.A., and... uh, I think it was in the back of my parents' minds to uh, try me out for some parts. I had the bright red hair and freckles, so I looked like the all-American kid. And uh, this was around 1956, mm-hmm. so uh, it was a good time to start trying. And the first year or so, I was mostly doing extra work, but uh, stuff like Gazi and Harriet and The Millionaire and uh, and shows like that. And uh, after a couple of years, I started getting the speaking parts. Yeah, so, so were your parents in the business, or no? No, and uh, it would have been nice if they had been. It would have <laughs> made made the, uh, the effort a lot easier, but uh, they were shopping around, and uh, as it happened, my first grade teacher, uh, her friend was an agent, and... Uh, it turned out that uh, the agent came to school one day to see her friend, the teacher, and uh, saw me in the class and then talked to my parents about maybe sending me out on some extra work. Yeah. So had you done a school play at least before that? No, nothing at all. Just, uh, you know, uh, going to school. And uh, we had moved from, uh, as I said, from the south side of Chicago, right into the heart of Watts. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I was like the only white kid in the class. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, not too long after that, we moved a little bit away from there, but we're still in, we were in the San Gabriel Valley after that. And uh, so it was, ma- it was a matter of uh, getting to a place where I'd be available to get over to a studio to either try out for a part or actually take part in some shows. So I had to get physically in that area before anything could really happen. Yeah, you're from that same generation of kid actors like John Provost and Mimi Gibson and Scott Morrow and all of them. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, yeah, I read Mimi Gibson's book recently. I really enjoyed it. And uh, Scott Morrow is a friend of mine on Facebook now because uh, I had worked with his brother on uh, GE Theater with Art Linkletter as the guest. And uh, so we kind of have been exchanging messages from time to time. Yeah, Scott's uh, been trying to make time to come on here and stuff, but I've talked to uh, John. His wife, Lori, is a very good friend of mine. And Oh, yeah. And Mimi, I talked to her uh, earlier this year. Yeah, they're good people. Yeah, and, you know, the funny thing is I had really lost touch with just about everybody over the years, and uh, about two years ago now uh, I finally retired. I was a flight attendant for 25 years with Northwest Airlines and then later with uh, Delta after the merger. 
and so once I got into the retirement mode, uh, I found myself with more time to start going back to other things I really cared about, like my mm -hmm. old acting friends and whatnot. Nice. So your first um, IMDb credit is uh, Bachelor Father. Do you remember anything about John Forsythe? Uh, just being on the set, and uh, there was talk, you know, the guest that week on the show was uh, Jack Benny. Yeah. And even though I was a little kid, because of my parents, uh, I knew exactly who Jack Benny was, and of course we used to see him on TV. But unfortunately, uh, his scenes... Uh, we're on a different day mm -hmm. than my oh. my shooting, and and basically my my part was quite small. I was in a in their living room, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, sitting on the floor, you know, like six years old or whatever. And uh, I get introduced to John Forsythe, get introduced to the father, uh, the bachelor father, <laughs> and uh, but. Uh, that was kind of my introduction, but I think the actual first thing I did was uh, Ozzy and Harriet. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was, again, like six years old, and uh, they had a special uh, episode that week about Christmas. And uh, Ozzy is dressed up as Santa Claus, and he's giving out candy and presents to the little kids, and I was just one of the little kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all all IMDb uh, entries are like incomplete. I didn't know you were on Ozzy yeah. and Harriet. Yeah, what, what, were the four preps on there? Four preps? I don't know about that one. Yeah, because they were they were regulars on there, and I just interviewed uh, the leader of one of them uh, earlier this year. Oh wow! Yeah, uh, I don't recall that. Uh, I mean, yeah, I know the four preps, but. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't run into them on my little mm -hmm. gig. <laughs> <laughs> then you were on The Rebel with Nick Adams. How was that? Well, that was good. Now, see, by the time we got up to The Rebel, uh, I was, I guess, 10, 9 or 10, mm -hmm. and I was finally getting, uh, you know, speaking parts and, and some decent parts. And uh, so I got to, you know, actually work with Nick Adams and that one, not not as an extra, but actually having a real role. And that's about the time when I was starting to get them. Uh, that one, and uh, I did a couple of episodes of Have Gun, Will Travel. Yeah. And those were also my early uh, opportunities to have speaking parts and kind of featured parts on shows. Mm -hmm. what, what, what was Nick Adams, uh, Nick Adams like, though? Uh, well, I was a kid, so... Uh, mm -hmm kind of limited exposure, just uh, friendly. He seemed to be rather quiet yeah. and uh, and reserved uh, when the cameras weren't rolling. But, uh, you know, he seemed to be kind of uh, dedicated, conscientious, and uh, but, but a little bit on the quiet side. Yeah, he was, he, he was one of those guys, you know, he was like, you know, just such a great actor and he was a handsome guy he was like james yeah. dean or jeffrey hunter and like he passed away way too soon and few people yeah. remember him now it's sad it sure is yeah but uh, uh yeah i was uh glad to have a chance and one other nice thing over all these years uh, since the availability of of course youtube and mm -hmm. and DVDs you can sometimes find in the nostalgia places. Uh, so I've been able to find a lot of the old shows I was on through a number of different avenues and then through some collectors who yeah. helped me out. <laughs> <laughs> also, Irvin Kirshner directed that episode. Oh, yeah, gee. Yeah, <laughs> the guy who made The Empire Strikes Back and RoboCop 2. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, flim yeah, flam man. Amazing what the things uh, you know sometimes came that came along later for different people. Uh, I know I, I was directed by Howard Koch on an episode of uh, The Untouchables. Yeah. Before he really hit the big hit the big time with everybody with uh, with other things. Yeah, you got any good stories about The Untouchables? Well, yeah, you know that was kind of funny one. Uh, for one thing. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with what the storyline was in my part, but uh, basically a gangster came up to me on the street. I was a street kid, mm -hmm. and uh, he's got a, a pair of trousers, and he says, will you 
bring these in there for me to the uh, dry cleaners and mm-hmm. tell them your dad wants them uh, pressed in a hurry. And uh, he gives me a quarter. But anyway, uh, the, in the lining of the pants is an explosive device, <laughs> which I didn't know. And uh, I bring it in. Uh, they know me in the dry cleaners. It's a kind of a neighborhood place. And uh, so I am going to wait there uh, while he presses them. But uh, I'm bouncing a ball, and uh, both the husband and wife say, you know, why don't you wait outside and, you know, play with your ball till we get it ready and then come back in. Yeah. So after I step outside, the place blows up. Oh. <laughs> and, and Claude Akins was the gangster, and he was mm-hmm. another great character actor of that time. Oh, yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. He was in um, one of the Planet of the Apes where he played the, uh, the gorilla general. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, the other neat thing about that was, and uh, I had even forgotten about it over the years, but even though they had outdoor scenes, exteriors, uh, they were all filmed actually inside the studio. And uh, and I remember, too, when they actually blew up the, uh, the dry cleaners, uh, it was inside the studio, but anyway, mm-hmm. I'd been, finally finished my scenes, and I'm waiting over to the side, and I'm going to get to watch them blow up the darn dry cleaners. And uh, so while I'm there, and they do it, afterwards they made a joke, said, well, let's try it again. And everybody started <laughs> laughing, like, oh, as if. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Also- and everybody was good, but I must admit, mm-hmm. I was having trouble with one of my lines. So I had to do it like five or six times. Mm -hmm. And I could tell uh, Howard Koch was getting a little impatient with me, but finally I was able to get the line out. It was kind of a tongue twister for me at that age. So uh, I didn't get it right the first time, as I always tried to do. Yeah, you also had Lee Van Cleef and Richard Deacon from Leave it to Beaver. He was in it. Yeah. Yeah, so many. And uh, as far as character actors and others go probably one of the best things to check out sometime if you get a chance is mm-hmm. uh, on my facebook page uh, john allen hyman uh, i have one album of different people who appeared on mckeever and the colonel the show i was on weekly nice. as cadet monk and i have about 35 or 40 different pretty well-known character actors who appeared in that uh, series as guests nice. and uh, it's just like a cavalcade of famous character actors they they got to be on the show nice uh, you mentioned before have gun will travel uh you did a couple episodes of that what was that like with uh, richard boone oh absolutely wonderful mm. he was so patient and so nice uh, the first one i did i was uh, again maybe nine mm. and uh and let's see, uh, Gene Lyons was, and Norma Crane were the other two leads. And there were only a couple other characters in the whole episode. Uh, J. Pat O'Malley was in it, too. Another great mm-hmm. character actor of that time. But anyway, uh, Richard Boone was just the nicest guy. He was really nice. And I forget if that's the one that was, uh, that was written by Aaron Spelling or if he did the second one I did. I... I forget over time which one it was but uh, Richard Boone himself was just a great guy and one of those episodes had Hal Needham in it yeah uh huh yeah god it was Hollywood was such a magical time everybody knew each other back then and everybody was working you know yeah I know it was it was really I'm so glad I I got in at such a good time <laughs> <laughs> let's see uh, Wagon Train with Ward Bond Yes, I was in one with Ward Bond. I did two episodes of that as well. Uh, one with Ward Bond, who was called the Mady Brandt mm-hmm. story. And uh, that one, I think, had Gene, K- Gene Hagen mm-hmm. as, as the lead in that one. But also uh, Richard Iyer was in it, too. Uh, mm-hmm. Another kid actor. He was a few years older than me. But uh, Richard Iyer was pretty popular back then as well in the episode i was in he kind of beats me up (laughs) (laughs) but uh yeah so i did that one and then i did another one with uh theodore bikel a famous folk singer actor broadway performer uh 
and I got to ride on stagecoach with him. And uh, it's a kind of funny scene because he's playing at first. He, let me see. At first, he's uh, he's playing. Uh, well, anyway, he plays the guitar, and he starts out very slowly. And I've got the reins. I'm I'm supposedly uh, in control of the horses, but uh, I'm just kind of going along at the same pace that he's singing and or, or playing and uh, mm. he starts playing faster and faster and I start doing the reins faster and faster. I'm like, if, it, if there were real horses connected to those reins, they'd be dead within minutes, you know, because I had gotten up to such a frantic pace. But uh, that was kind of funny and I, I'm sure nobody really realized it at the time but it, as, when I watched it again, I thought, darn, I hope I'm glad there weren't really horses attached to those reins. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How was uh, the Twilight Zone experience? Well, that was another very special one. And, of course, whenever anybody asks me about uh, work I'd done in the past, there are so many shows I did that people just, uh, their eyes glaze over when I mention the names because a lot of the shows never... Uh, connected over the years you know they were popular at the time but not later mm -hmm. on so i always mention uh the twilight zone because everybody knows that and i mentioned leave it to beaver because everybody knows that you know mm -hmm. even though the beaver thing i had a very small part in that yeah let's see nancy culp was in that twilight zone also yeah and little susan gordon yeah. And uh, she's long since passed away, but she was, uh, as you probably know, she was in a lot of science fiction stuff. Yes. But yeah. A very nice little girl. In fact, the reason I got to meet uh, Rod Serling was because uh, Susan had gotten uh, faint when we were filming it out at uh, Griffith Park, mm -hmm. uh, the scene on the sand, you know, the sand lot, mm -hmm. uh, uh, baseball place and uh, she'd gotten faint and it was a hot day so they decided to take her over to a local clinic just to have her looked at and so there was a slight lull in the production and uh, Rod Serling was already there getting ready to do that introductory scene he always did with the shows and he was sitting on the bench over on the side there and uh, because we had a, a little break there in the production, I went over and said hello to him and as he was sitting there on the bench. And uh, I was glad I had the courage to go over and say hello. <laughs> there were other kids working that day too, but I think I was the only one who actually uh, went over and talked to him. Oh, that's nice. Did you ever, did you ever get on the Alfred Hitchcock Presents? No, I wish I had, you know, like Billy Moomy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did one after another, but uh, I uh, I never got a chance to do that one, unfortunately. Well, yeah, you did do uh, Leave it to Beaver. Uh, Don Drysdale was in that episode. Yeah, and this is another case where yeah. he wasn't physically uh, at the soundstage or at the studio uh, the day I was doing my filming. And uh, most of his work he did on that episode was over the phone. You know, the, yeah. the scenes you see him doing, uh, he's talking on the phone to uh, Beaver. Yeah, but, the, uh, he, it's funny. His career was was so short, yet he made such an impact. They were always asking him to do sitcoms. He was on The Munsters, The Brady Bunch. I mean, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's yeah, amazing. He did a lot, and I, I, uh, so I didn't get to meet, meet him at that time, but... A few years later, I was in a garage band with his nephew, <laughs> uh -huh. and so uh, we got to play parties. He, Drysdale himself, kind of set us up to play different private parties for the Dodgers and the Rams with our garage band, and uh, yeah, his nephew was the, the bass player with us, and finally... Uh, they arranged for us to play for the New Year's Eve party at Drysdale's Dugout in the San Fernando Valley, the, the club that Don Drysdale owned. Nice. And uh, the New Year's Eve party, and uh, for one song, we got to back up uh, Sonny and Cher. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just kind of fun stuff like that. And uh, you, got, you got to meet Sonny and Cher? Yeah, uh -huh. we backed mm -hmm. them up on I Got You, Babe, there in the bar. Nice. Nice. They were nice. 
Oh, yeah, yeah. And I had seen them once before at my high school uh, when I was a little bit younger. Uh, in high school, they played on the show. Uh, well, there was a show back then called Where the Action Is. Mm -hmm. It was uh, partly done at my high school, U.S. Grant High School. And different performers of all sorts used to actually lip sync their songs uh, as they were on the on the campus of my school, and so I got to see them at that time too, as well as uh, Donna Lauren, who's another yeah. popular one from that era. Uh, she had been at our school too, and the Association, the Knack, uh, a lot of nitty gritty dirt band. A lot of them uh, came to our school for those things. Nice. So. Do you get cast on McKeever and the Colonel because you had worked with somebody previously, or how did that work out? Oh, that was, uh, well, I was working quite a bit on other shows at the time, mm -hmm. and so I was one of dozens who got, you know, got an interview for the part. Uh, originally, it was probably back in December of, uh, of well, it was the beginning of, uh, of 62, actually, and... Uh, I had, I think I had two or three callbacks for the part. And uh, I wasn't sure, I was actually the last one hired to be a regular cast member on the show. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, it wasn't easy getting it. Uh, lots of competition and, uh, and also, uh, like I said, I had to go back two or three times, I think. Mm -hmm. Did you know Scott Lane already? No, I didn't. But, you know, he's one person where as soon as we started working together, we clicked right away. We just got along so great. I was very proud that I was always able to make him laugh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we uh, just hit it off, we, you know, after we started actually filming the show uh, in the summer of 62. Uh, we used to stay at each other's houses, and I was there in the valley, and he was in Beverly Hills. His dad was a composer and, and pianist, uh, mm -hmm. Ivan Lane. And they lived in Beverly Hills, and uh, he would come and, uh, you know, uh, stay at our house, which was in the valley, and a kind of middle class or lower middle class house. <laughs> yeah. My dad was a refrigeration mechanic. So uh, it was quite a, like two worlds, but we got along great. And uh, just two years ago, uh, we finally, after all these years, got together again. And he and his wife came up here. You know, I live a little bit north of uh, Seattle. Mm -hmm. And he and his wife came up from L.A. Uh, for a week or so. And uh, we actually got back together again, took, took a few pictures. But we traveled around the area, around my neck of the woods up in the north. And uh, I showed he and his wife around different areas, Anacortes and uh, La Conner and some other places up in our part of the world, and with his wife, Jan. And uh, we just had a great time. And then uh, pretty recently, just a few months ago, they were up here again, so we, uh, we got together one more time. But it's one of those persons where I'm sure you have friends like this too. You might not see them for 20 years, but within yeah. moments of seeing each other again, it's like no time at all had passed. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the the, the hair may pass, but that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Yeah, I'm glad yeah. I still got some, but. I didn't. Yeah, you know, I didn't grow up on this show. I found out about it when the internet hit, and you know, I've seen episodes on YouTube. Um, you know, how was working with Jackie Coogan? Because this was probably his first big role after losing everything, you know, before uh, the Abs family. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, he'd been doing those uh, B movies for a while. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I must admit that we were all a little bit intimidated by him. Yeah. Uh, us kids, because, uh, you know, he'd been through all this stuff. But uh, he, in interviews, he had said this, that... Uh, he said, I didn't care what the kids call me as long as it was Mr. Coogan. Yeah. You know, and stuff like, and yes, sir. He was big on the discipline side, but he was also a very kind man, too. Mm -hmm. he, he could be both. And uh, he helped us learn how to do the military maneuvers. Yeah. Uh, 
which we had a lot of on that show, and also uh, how to tie our ties and make it look uh, the way it should as uh, members of the military academy, you know. And yeah. uh, he gave me a nice present, too, uh, when my birthday came along in October of 62, uh, a nice uh, a book about old movies. And uh, so he was a very nice man, actually. But uh, again, we had to be a little bit on the careful side not to overstep our, our parts. I heard once that uh, he had worked with a kid, and I don't know, it might have even been one of us, mm -hmm. that uh, they had made a suggestion about, hey, Mr. Coogan, don't you think it would be funnier if, you know, we did that? And, and he goes, no. <laughs> he, you know, like, forget it. You're a kid. So uh, he had that side to him, too. So you just had to kind of know where you stood. Yeah, I talked to his uh, grandson, Keith, last year, and um, we, were talking, oh. we were talking about, you know, just how loyal he was to Charlie Chaplin long after they had worked together when he was a kid. I mean, he was in the audience of when he won the Academy Award, you know, the honorary Oscar, all those, oh. years, all those years later. I mean, that kind of loyalty doesn't exist much in Hollywood today. No, no, it's a different world altogether. Yeah, it's sad. Uh, William Shallert uh, guest starred a couple times on there. Do you have any memories of him? Uh, no, and uh, unfortunately, because uh, of course I knew who he was, and I yeah. was glad he was working on the show. But it, as far as I can remember, I don't think I had any scenes with him myself. And you know, it's a weird thing too with kids working on TV series, and maybe even more so back then than now, but, you know, we had to get in the three hours of school each day. Yeah. And so when we weren't filming our scenes, we had to rush back into the classroom with the tutor and, uh, and get in at least 15 minute increments, uh, of schooling up to three hours a day. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we didn't have a lot of time to hang around and chit chat with, uh, a lot of the guests. Though there were a few that I'm glad I had a little bit of a chance to talk with, among them yeah. uh, Soupy Sales. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yes. And I had worked with him when I was a little kid. Uh, he did a pilot mm -hmm. called Where There's Smokey, where he was a volunteer, uh, volunteer fireman, along with, uh, and his boss was Gail Gordon. But they, they did a, a, a pilot that didn't sell. But, uh, I worked with him then, and then he became a guest on McKeever and the Colonel yeah. as a former student, a uh, former cadet of the school who had been a prankster back when he was at the school. And uh, he came uh -huh. and, uh, and we think, we, we think he's a goody two shoes, but actually he had been a prankster himself back in the day. Uh -huh. the, the nice part about it was that, uh, he was so nice to us that he even invited us to a taping of his show. And of course, his show that didn't have an audience. So we were very special to get in to watch them tape the show. Yeah, oh, that's he's cool. Nice guy. Oh, yeah. He, uh, he's, he's him and uh, I think it was Red Skeleton. They're like the originators of the pie in the face in comedy, right? <laughs> yeah, all that physical comedy stuff. And uh, so when he did the guest on our episode, our show too, uh, they had a pie throwing scene, and uh, that uh, kind of a chaotic pie throwing scene uh, on the show. You know, it was just a, a ball, and uh, I was especially happy to work with him. And uh, we also had. Uh, Gosh, I feel we had Mel Blanc. Oh, yeah. Uh, not uh, on camera, but he was the voice of a raven who was the mascot of our uh, competitors, our rival uh, military academy school that we had kidnapped the raven, and he did the voice of the raven. And yeah. he was there at the uh, soundstage for the reading of the script, and uh, we had had the real pleasure of having him read through a page or so of our script uh, as different voices, <laughs> Bugs Bunny and Porky Pig and, uh, and stuff like that. So he, Again, a very nice guy, but at that particular time, his wife had just died uh, very recently, mm -hmm. and so we were advised not to say anything about that, but oh. he's a very nice guy. Yeah, did you also do a pilot with Jane Wyman? 
I sure did, and that's the one. That's like the one that got away because yeah. uh, I was playing her son Tommy, mm-hmm. and uh, we got to film it up at uh, Big Bear on location, mm-hmm. and uh, that actually they'd gotten a sponsor and everything, and word was that it was going to be a pretty pretty good series, mm-hmm. but at the last minute. Uh, Ms. Wyman backed out of the deal. I think there was something about the the time slot, and something that didn't seem big to us, but uh, was important to her. And uh, she backed out of the deal. So the pilot, even though it had sold, I guess, uh, just uh, never made it to the air. Although it was on TV as a TV movie. Nice. Yeah. yeah. What was she like? Real nice. And I think this is another case where on a lot of shows, I didn't get to really bond with the with a lot of the actors, but on that one, I did because I think partly because I was playing her son, mm-hmm. and uh, we were on location, so she was going out of her way to become friendly with me, and uh, you know, we went to the downtown area there, and uh, we're looking in the shops and things together. So they, she was making a real effort to make me feel close to her because I was going to be playing her son. Yeah. Was, was, was Four Star at 20th Century Fox? Four Star was the old uh, Republic uh, Studios. Oh, okay. And, uh-huh. and at that time, uh, in that day, we used to have McKeever and the Colonel, the Rifleman, was filmed there. Mm-hmm. And uh, let's see... Uh, a few other shows, and the Lloyd Bridges show, and not not this Sea Hunt, but a later yeah. anthology series he did, and uh, and the one with uh, oh, I'm trying to think. Well, that, anyway, there there were a few others also being filmed there at the time. Oh yeah, Track Ensign, Down. Yeah, Ensign O'Toole was the other one I was trying to think of. Yeah, Ensign O'Toole was uh, was uh, another one that. We used to run into those people all the time too around the, the lot. Yeah, track down with Robert Culp was at uh, four star before that in the fifties. Um, yeah, every every stu- every major movie studio had a TV uh, department. You know, Desi Lou was at Paramount. Review was at Universal. Uh, uh-huh. Scream Gems was at Columbia, which is now Sunset Gowers, where all the sh- uh, TV series was filmed. You know, in the sixties, seventies, and eighties. Yeah, it's just uh, there's a lot of history there. <laughs> yeah, and uh, well, another good thing about with the four star. Uh, uh, studios. The one thing I liked is they had a nice little commissary, and it was pretty small, but uh, it was all the more chance to uh, meet or say hello to different people. Uh, it, it didn't seem like a real big place to me, uh, even back at 12 and 13 years old, but I got to go in and watch them uh, film a scene uh, of the Rifleman, because uh, Johnny Crawford was there and his grandma was with him most of the time. But uh, they got us in to uh, watch Mickey Rooney film uh, a scene from his guest spot on The Rifleman, where he sang, I've got a lovely bunch of coconuts. And we got to be there on the set to watch him do it. And uh, not long after that, uh, going into the cafeteria, uh, running into Sammy Davis Jr. And that was another, wow, experience, you know. (laughs) Sammy, yeah, oh God, he was one of the greats, really was. Yeah. You were in a, a movie called Never Too Late with Paul Ford and Connie Stevens and Maureen Sullivan. Uh, yes, mm-hmm. yeah, and that was uh, uh, interesting. It, it was a very, very, very small part, but it's in the dream sequence when yeah. he's imagining how old he's going to be uh, as the boy grows up. Uh, and uh, I'm of course, playing the boy as a teenager. And uh, I come rush, rushing into the house with my football uniform on, and uh, I come up to him. He gets out of his rocking chair, and uh, I, I slam the football into his gut, and he falls over. And, <laughs> and I mean, it's a very small uh, dream sequence part, but uh, I enjoyed working on it. And uh, other than that, you know, I got to work with Connie Stevens on a one-season sitcom called Wendy and Me mm-hmm. with George Burns. 
and uh, it was only on for a year, but uh, uh, George Burns played the uh, like the landlord or, or the manager of an apartment building, mm-hmm. and she's a young married woman uh, married to a airline pilot. But uh, I got to work with her, and I got to dance with her on that episode. So that was for right. a fifteen-year-old. That was a super big deal. <laughs> <laughs> Did you try to get into more movies? Uh, I wish I had gotten more opportunities to be in movies. So most of my career was TV stuff, and uh, mm-hmm. I enjoyed that. But uh, for some reason, I didn't get called out as much for uh, for chances to be in movies. Uh, I don't know if that had partly to do with the agent I had and the connections she had, but uh, most of my stuff was uh, TV stuff. The last uh, TV show you did was Petticoat Junction. Uh, actually, there was one later, and uh, uh, one I don't, uh, I don't even usually mention much was uh, Love American Style. Oh, really? Was the absolute, <laughs> was the absolute last thing I did, and for good reason. Uh, it was terrible. <laughs> I had taken the part, I was about 18 or so, 19, mm-hmm. 18, I guess, and uh, my agent said, take this thing, it's only got a couple of lines, but you know, hey, you'll get in a uh, a little paycheck and uh, what the heck, you know? And so I thought, oh, okay. And I get there and they took away the lines, so I was almost like an extra. And uh, kind of, uh, not just deflating for my ego, but (laughs) kind of disappointing all the way around. and, uh, And so after that, I was, still going out for uh, parts, but uh, just not getting anything. And uh, also at that time, I was playing more in bands, playing guitar. And uh, so I was gravitating more towards music by that point. And uh, then I also had to deal with the draft. So I had to uh, get in uh, my, I had to be a full-time student in order to avoid going to Vietnam. So uh, mm-hmm. that limited me, too. I couldn't just miss classes all the time, as I had done when I was younger. I had to keep that uh, a full load of credits. Otherwise, I'd, I'd lose my deferment and have to go to Vietnam. Yeah. So did you just get tired of acting after a while? Well, I, I don't think I would have gotten tired of it if I'd gotten work. <laughs> <laughs> but always, you know, schlepping around from studio to studio, especially after I'd grown up and I couldn't rely on my folks. Mm-hmm. I had to make a living uh, on my own. They were lower middle class, you know, and uh, they they couldn't really support me forever. So uh, I had to get work and I had to uh, take care of myself. And it got harder and harder to get those phone calls before we had the Internet and before we had call waiting and all that good stuff so uh it got harder and harder for me to be available uh to get around to the studios as i had when i was younger and could rely more on my folks mm-hmm. you went to college right and you were in a band with ed begley jr yes <laughs> that, that was the, the one where we got to back up sunny and Cher, as a matter of fact oh. <laughs> and uh, we were in valley college theater arts together mm-hmm. with a bunch of really really talented people and uh and so yeah we did theater arts and then we did the band together and uh, played uh, like i said we played a lot of parties for the uh, rams and the dodgers back in that time and uh, we used to hang out a lot together Mm -hmm. and to this day we're still real good friends though because I'm up here in Seattle and he's down there in L.A., we don't get a chance to see each other much, but uh, we're still pretty close. Yeah, was he the drummer? He was the drummer, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and the funny thing is, uh, the band I'd had just before that uh, in high school, mm-hmm. uh, our drummer was uh, Whitey from Leave it to Beaver. Oh, Stanley yeah. Stanley Fafar uh, was our drummer uh, with the garage band. He, uh, yeah, yeah, Begley. He yeah. he he was the yeah. first drummer in Spinal Tap, and he was Whitey in one of the Leave It to Beaver reunions. Yeah, another big coincidence. I know. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, I sent him an email years ago, and he uh, replied me my questions. He just seems like just a genuine, authentic guy. He is, and he 
has a, such a good reputation, uh, not only in the business, but upon, uh, among regular folks, too. Uh, his involvement and his caring for things like the environment yeah. and, uh, and social justice and all that. In fact, you know, back in the theater arts days, I was one of the first to go in his uh, very first electric car when he was living in a little apartment in the valley, and uh, he'd gotten the new electric car, and uh, I talked him into driving driving it with me out to uh, into Hollywood from the valley, going mm -hmm. over Coenga Pass. He couldn't take the darn thing on the freeway. It was a glorified golf cart, you know. But <laughs> we, we drove it uh, into Hollywood, and I had some friends uh, uh, who were involved in something. I think it was something involved in the environment. And, uh, and we went out there for a while, and then it wasn't so bad going out to Hollywood because that was downhill. Coming back over Coanga Pass was more of a challenge because the thing wouldn't go much over 30 miles an hour, you know. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> we had a lot of fun, and we both were drinkers back then, too, so... Uh, both of us no longer do that, but uh, mm -hmm. back in the day, we were we were both into drinking and going out and gallivanting, so uh, <laughs> we did our share of that as well. Of course. You lived in uh, Japan for a while, right? Ten years, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. from uh, about the age uh, of 25 to 35, mm -hmm. and uh, taught English over there. I went over there originally. I was going to go over for one month and uh, meet my girlfriend, who is Japanese, meet my girlfriend's parents, and, you know, just uh, at least check it out, see Japan for a month or so, and then go back to working in L.A. again. But as it turned out, I got over there, and one month turned into ten years. So we got married, had a typical uh, uh, Shinto Japanese wedding in a shrine, and uh, both our kids were born over there, and I uh, taught English over there for 10 years, and in addition to that, I had a weekly uh, singing singing and playing guitar solo gig for almost the entire 10 years uh, at, at local clubs in Japan, and I think they liked me because I could speak English so well, and... Uh, when I was singing, <laughs> and, and of course they couldn't tell if I screwed up the lyrics because uh, my English was too good for them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that must have been a good experience overall, though. Yeah, and both our kids were born over there. We came back to the States uh, in 85, mm -hmm. when both of our kids were still little. They were like second grade and first grade, and uh, we decided to start over again basically in the pacific northwest where i'd never even visited before uh, thanks to the help of one of my friends in japan an american guy whose parents were in seattle mm -hmm. who agreed to let us stay at their place for a month or so while i found us a place to live nice so i've listened to the music on your youtube channel it's really good i like um the only one is you. You're gonna get it. There are pretty catchy songs you do. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I'm yeah. glad you did that because uh, you know uh, a lot of times that subject doesn't even come up. Yeah, I just I don't understand it. Um, but like you know, so you do you, do you write songs all the time? Do you still play? Uh, you know, I still write, and I that's the thing I really like to do is uh, is write songs, and I. <clears throat> play and I sing just so I can get them down. You know, uh, most of the stuff I was even putting up on YouTube was more or less as a rough draft to where maybe I could approach some real professionals, <laughs> some really good singers or really good musicians to perform them. And, uh, but in order to get them at least down on on video or something, I would do them myself. But I've got a nice little setup here at the house. It's a rather simple setup, but a 16-track digital recording workstation, a little a uh, little device, and a uh, uh, kind of rinky-dink Casio uh, uh, keyboard and uh, a few different guitars. And uh, then I can overdub myself and do some harmonies and that sort of thing. And uh, it's just a lot of fun for me. It's very fulfilling. Yeah. So are you a multi-instrumentalist? Uh, not so much. I can play enough uh, 
keyboard to just to get by, but uh, I've never studied it or anything. I uh, it just managed mm -hmm. to get by a little bit, and then guitar. You know, I've been nice. playing since I was about 15. My first band, as a matter of fact, uh, I got recruited into this band when I couldn't even play chords. Mm -hmm. uh, the lead guitarist with the band, who, who was 15, said, hey, I'll teach you what you need to know. And we were doing garage band stuff, but the funny thing is, he went on to be the lead guitarist for the Carpenters, uh, Tony Peluso. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, he was great. I mean, the whole band, they were all Italian except for me. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> again, I was kind of an outcast, but uh, they were all excellent musicians, even as kids. So uh, at least I was in, a, in with a good group, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, Tony Peluso did really well uh, as we were able to get together again a couple of times, even... Uh, got together with me when they were performing in Japan with the Carpenters mm -hmm. and uh, we went out for coffee and stuff. Nice. So you'll be at the Hollywood show October 21st and 22nd. Is this your first time doing the show? It certainly is. And once again, it it's partly as a result of uh, all those years I was working as a flight attendant uh, for 25 years. I just basically concentrated on doing that kind of like a, a one trick pony i just wanted to uh, do that and i also had a very irregular schedule so i never even considered doing one of these shows but uh, very recently just uh, this past the beginning of this summer uh, i had become friends with uh, larry thomas the mm -hmm. soup nazi yeah <laughs> uh, uh, face on facebook and uh he also went to my high school. He went to Valley College. And mm. and so we had certain things in common. And he said, well, why don't you go to one of those shows? You know, he he introduced me to the the owner uh, of it uh, over the phone. And, uh, mm. and we arranged for me to attend this time around. But I hadn't even really thought about it. And there was also that part of me that said, well, I am not worthy. You know, I, I think of all the kid stars, uh, like this coming, this one coming up, uh, Jerry Mathers will be there, Jay North will be there, you know, household names. And uh, I didn't consider myself in the same category as them, but I thought, well, shoot, I did work a lot, and uh, uh, I had some decent parts along the way, and I, I worked for many, many years, so uh, what the heck, what have I got to lose? Yeah. <laughs> There's a great lineup. I mean, Laurie and John will be there, uh, Stanley yeah. Livingston, uh, Melanie Chardoff. I love her. She's one of my favorite guests. Um, oh, yeah. Clint Howard, Gary Conway. I wish I could go. I haven't been to a Hollywood show yet. I was actually supposed to go to one when the pandemic started. They were going to have a Grease reunion there. But oh. someday, someday I will go to a Hollywood show. But I hope you have a blast there. And it was great having you on today, Johnny. Much. I've had a, a really good time talking with you. Thank you. I appreciate it so much. You have yourself a great day and please be safe out there. Okay, thank you. You too. Thank you. Bye bye. Uh, bye bye. Well, there you have it. Johnny Iman. Ain't he a cool dude? Nice guy, huh? Great stories there. I love talking to child act former child actors and journeymen. They got the best stories. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Liar, dudes. <laughs>